Jeff has a professional history as an entrepreneur and writer and is well known for founding Stockhouse Media Corporation and for his contributions to libertarian and finance websites. He's the host of Anarchist and, fin of Anarchist and a financial newsletter, The Dollar Vigilante. Let's hear it for Jeff Berwick. Hello? Hello? Not very loud. Is it that good? Can you hear me? Good? How you doing? How's everyone doing? Good to be here. So yeah, I was just thinking, I was here last year, and uh, so many things have changed. And of course, if you were here last year, I was talking about things are going to get worse, uh, banks are going to collapse, fiat currencies are going to be collapsing, not necessarily in the next year, but a lot of stuff's actually happened in the last year. Actually, in the last few months alone, uh, so much stuff has happened. You look at Cyprus, uh, daylight bank robbery. Many people had 50% of the money in their bank accounts just taken away, stolen by the government and central banks. Uh, that's going to happen all over the place. That's going to happen in Italy next. Uh, it's going to happen all throughout Europe. It's going to happen in the US. It's going to happen in Canada. Uh, and many of these countries now are actually putting in bail-in clauses, like literally bail-in clauses. They're writing it in. This is basically a Cyprus uh, thing they're doing, saying if our banks have problems, uh, they're allowed to take their customers' money. So definitely uh, stay away from the, this financial system. It's going to continue to collapse. Uh, many of the other things that have happened in the last year, or last few months, which is pretty crazy, uh, Boston, of course, uh, turned into a complete police state for a few days because some 19-year-old boy, theoretically, was running around with kitchen equipment, throwing it out of his car, and everyone hid in their houses. That was interesting in the uh, land of the free, home of the brave, that t t millions of people hid in their houses because of this 19-year-old boy, which wasn't even true in the first place, of course. So yeah, things are getting pretty wild and crazy. Uh, there's so much that's been happening. Uh, now we have uh, Snowden who's come out just last week. Uh, we already knew this, everyone probably already knew this, but this is actually much more factual information that the US government is spying on, it's not working good? No one can hear you. Oh really? No one can hear me? Should I start again? Hello? Oh. Ah. Should I start from the top? <laughs> have I been talking to myself this whole time? <laughs> okay. That's better. All right. Sorry. Um, yeah, so we have Snowden now, who's uh, uh, ba basically proven that what we've been talking about, that the U.S. government is recording every single piece of data pretty much on Earth now. So this is much worse than East Germany. This is uh, much more of a surveillance state than any other state in history by far. Uh, and then when you tie that in with the police state, with all the other things that the government's doing, uh, you, you look at the amount of uh, debt, uh, it's in every single way that you can think of, uh, the U.S. Is, is quickly collapsing. Uh, just to give a bit of background on how we got to this point, uh, of course in 1913 with the founding of the Federal Reserve, or, which uh, was of course a, a basically a coup and a takeover of the financial system, and at the exact same time they put in the income tax. Uh, by 1933 they had already uh, conf confiscated gold, uh, in the land of the free, uh, so Americans couldn't even own gold for decades. Uh, then 1971 was the real last nail in the coffin when they took the, any sort of gold backing away from the dollar. And ever since then, because we have a socialist, democratic, uh, fascist, almost communist nation-state system all throughout the West, all these governments have been going into massive amounts of debt. You look at the U.S. today, it's going up uh, more than a trillion dollars a year in debt right now. It's $17 trillion at the moment and quickly going up. And that doesn't even include, because they don't account for it properly. If you actually uh, look at it with uh, generally accepted accounting principles, uh, the total debt is, uh, and liabilities is over $80 trillion, $85 trillion or more. It's really hard to, because actually the U.S. government actually doesn't really do any real accounting. There's actually been no real accounting done at most departments in the U.S. government, including the Department of Offense, which uh, on September 10th, 2001, I don't know if everyone here knows this, you can go on YouTube, Donald Rumsfeld announced that they were missing $2.2 trillion, and 2.3, sorry, uh, it's, 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 yeah, it's probably even more than that. And uh, the next day, uh, something hit the accounting department of the Pentagram, and uh, so that was strange. So, and, and the, account, the auditors and all those people, they all say, well, we don't, re no, we can't, we 
there's no way, there's no tracking all this money. So there really is no way to know all the debt and liabilities of the U.S. government. But just with the numbers we do know, it's already uh, beyond, uh, it's totally unsustainable and it will collapse. Uh, if you look at $85 trillion, that's about uh, four, almost $500,000, or sorry, $250,000 per person in the U.S. Uh, so a family of four has over a million dollars worth of federal government debt and liabilities overhanging it. So this is not sustainable at all. It's all going to come to a collapse. It's already in collapse if you look at what's going on. Um, I think Japan's going to be one of the first to fall. Uh, they're, they're a huge mess. Uh, they, have, they have a massive amount of debt as well. The um, population is, is aging. It's got very bad demographics, and they're all starting to retire now, and there's no money there. And so the Bank of Japan, just about a month ago, announced that they're going to devalue the yen by 50% in the next two years. They're going to double the money supply in the next two years, which is Keynesian on steroids. It's, it's absolutely insane. And uh, that's going to be a huge collapse. Uh, Europe's already done. Uh, you can see it all the time. Italy's very close. You can see all the things they're doing. They're, um, they just announced that they're going to put Dolce & Gabbana in jail for a year and a half for tax fraud. I like that word, tax fraud. <laughs> uh, it's such a strange term to me. It's like if someone tries to mug you on the street and you run away, that's mugging fraud. You know, it's like... But that's, that's what they say, and, and uh, there, a man was trying to actually leave Italy recently. He put some gold in his car, and they caught him, caught him, and uh, stole it all from him uh, for whatever reason. So they're trying, there's, they're definitely uh, very close right now, and there's a, gonna, effectively there are capital controls over there right now. Uh, so it's going to be a big mess, definitely, if, you, if you're in the financial system at all, the Western financial system, get out of it in any way you can. And of course, we can talk about Bitcoin and bullion and, and all kinds of things, and that's what I'm here to talk about for the most part. Um, let's start with uh, gold bullion. Uh, I think it's incredibly important if you have precious metals to make sure that uh, it's outside of your own country, at least some of it, uh, because, or at least very well hidden. Um, midnight gardening, all those sort of things, because they, they will come after that uh, in one way or another. Or possibly they'll just in institute some sort of a tax, maybe a 90% tax or 99% tax on any gold transaction. Uh, they, have, they have all the guns, uh, and, and so they, they can do whatever they want. And it's really important if you have some to try to get it outside of the country. Uh, we wrote a report called Getting Your Gold Out of Dodge, and um, it uh, talks about how you can invest and, and put your precious metals in other places, things like goldmoney.com, bullionvault.com. All of these places are uh, places that you can buy uh, precious metals over the internet and you can store them in vaults in places like Switzerland, um, Singapore. Uh, a lot of these other places are much better because they have a, a lot less debt um, and, and they have no history of taking over their private uh, citizens' assets, unlike the U.S. government, which does that all the time. Uh, so it's really important to, to get your bullion out, um, at or at least not have it in the financial system. So definitely don't hold it in a bank safe deposit box. When, when those banks are all going to collapse, and uh, they'll just shut down the safety deposit boxes too, or just abscond what's ever in them. So you definitely have to be very, this is a very, to me this is the most dangerous time in human history for capital. Uh, because the entire system has bought into this Western fiat currency system, when it collapses, it's going to be incredibly dangerous for capital. And a lot of money, a lot of wealth is going to disappear overnight. Anything that's paper will basically disappear over the next few years. It might not be this year, it might not be next year, it could be five years. I, d I can't see it going ten more years. If you look at the numbers, it's impossible. Uh, so something big is going to happen. Who knows what's going to happen, but it's, it's definitely going to be dangerous. So you definitely want to keep your, uh, get precious metals, stay out of the financial system. Um, uh, and this recent downturn in gold and silver is interesting, and I think it's definitely a huge buying opportunity. I don't think it's going to go too much lower. I think the, the, the uh, paper gold market and the actual bullion market are starting to segregate, they're starting to d diverge. Uh, because they, a lot of the banks and a lot of the governments, central banks, can control the paper market a lot easier than the physical market. So what happened when gold went down $200 a few months ago was you couldn't buy precious metals almost anywhere on earth. We called all over the planet, we called everyone, right after gold went down $200 in the paper market, 
And we said, can you buy bullion where you're at? And no one had any bullion for sale, not at that price at least. And it was really almost impossible to even get any for about a week uh, until slowly uh, some started to come back into the system. Uh, but I think that's going to be what's going to happen in the future is there's going to come a point where you won't even be able to buy gold or silver bullion for fiat currencies at all. And that might be coming quite quick. So if you have some assets and you want some precious metals, I would t urge you to do so quickly because this is going to be very interesting when this all starts to transpire. So uh, I think it's very important uh, to, to have some right now because you might not be able to buy any in a year or two. Uh, it, definitely not at the paper price. I think we're going to start to see the paper price and the, and the physical price diverge massively. And we already are in some ways. The, uh, just the, the, uh, the cost of silver, uh, junk silver is, is at record highs for, for um, the premium over the, the price. Uh, in Chile, for example, I just came back from there. You can't buy gold, gold bullion for less than, it's some huge amount, like $400 over spot. Uh, and even that's very hard to get. Uh, so there's a lot of this stuff happening. So it's going to be very interesting. So that's one way to protect yourself uh, from this coming collapse. Of course, another way is Bitcoin. Um, I'm very excited about Bitcoin. Bitcoin's the first free market, private money since gold and silver. Uh, and one of the interesting things to me is that I've been talking about this for years now, about the coming dollar collapse. And the, uh, a lot of people used to say, they'd say, well, what, what are we going to use for money if the government doesn't run the money system? And I always used to answer, I'm sure the private enterprise, a free market, will come up with a solution. And Bitcoin has proved me right. And there's going to be many more things like that uh, coming out. And of course, Bitcoin's got a huge, huge uh, amount of opposition coming from the US government. Uh, usually with the governments, when the internet first came out, uh, it, I, I, when I first saw the internet came out in 1994, I looked around and I went, when's the government going to shut this down? And I wasn't even an anarchist back then. I just sensed or knew that the government was bad. And uh, it really took them 10 or 15 years to catch on that this is going to be a major problem for them with the people having access to information. So they were very slow on that. Um, and so you look at Bitcoin now. Bitcoin, of course, started in 2009. Uh, it's now 2013, and already the governments and central banks are all over it, saying we have to regulate it and all this sort of stuff. And of course they can't, but uh, they're going to cause a lot of problems. And I recently started, uh, I was involved in a Bitcoin ATM enterprise, which actually started here uh, by someone in, this, uh, in the free state. And um, I just got involved in it for a while, and I was trying to promote it. And we hired some lawyers and we said, so what are we going to have to do to put a Bitcoin ATM where you could put money into an ATM or take money out of it from your Bitcoin account? And they came back and they said, well, you're under four or five different regulatory agencies. You're under finance, money, banking, even telecommunications because it uses the internet. Um, it, unbelievable. And the biggest one was if we were going to open a Bitcoin ATM in the US, we would be considered money transmitters. Uh, sort of like Western Union, and you need a minimum $25 million insurance bond, of course, to even operate. And so uh, this is how the fascist system works. This is how they keep competition out, is by having all these regulations and making it almost impossible for people to compete. So uh, that kind of fell apart, and I'm not involved with that project anymore for a number of different reasons. Uh, but uh, I was actually almost happy when I wasn't involved in it anymore after I saw all the government regulations. Of course, in different countries, they don't have those regulations, but the U.S. looks, if you're doing that in a different country and somehow some money got routed through the U.S., uh, it's just unbelievable. They'll come after you. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I know some other people here are doing uh, some sort of Bitcoin ATM, and we'll see what happens. I wish them the best, of course. I, I want Bitcoin to get out there. Uh, and it's really exciting what's going on in Bitcoin. Uh, really, I, I think it really is going to catch on, uh, but it's going to be a struggle. Uh, the U.S. government and the central banks and the European government, uh, they're all going to fight it as much as possible. Uh, the good news is, though, that the U.S. is pretty much a third world country now, and it's uh, not really all that important anymore in the grand scheme of things internationally. So even if the government makes it so that Bitcoin really can't be used very easily in the U.S. by companies by using their guns to shut down those companies. It's not a big deal because many other countries will be doing that and their governments are nowhere near as efficient 
or as overarching or oppressive as the U.S. government. Uh, so all that will happen is, yet again, the U.S. economy will be left behind as the rest of the world moves forward on it. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, Bitcoin, of course, started the year at around $15. It's around 100 right now, as last I checked. Uh, so it's been doing quite well. If you look at gold since 2000, of course, it was around 250. It's now around 1300, last I checked. Uh, so these things have been doing quite good. And then the other part I wanted to talk about was bullets. I was actually at an investment conference in Bahamas about two years ago. And I was on a conference and I was talking about protecting yourself through bullion and, and these sort of a things. And a person put their hand up and they said, yeah, we've heard this before, invest in gold. He said, give us uh, one thing we haven't heard before to invest in. And I said, bullets. And a lot of people laughed. Uh, but the price of ammunition has been going up tremendously, of course. Uh, it's mostly because the Department of Homeland Insecurity is buying almost all the bullets, billions of bullets. Uh, f like, if this doesn't uh, wake some people up to what's going on, I don't know what's going to. They're buying tanks, uh, billions of hollow point round bullets to, you know, to protect the homeland from the people, I guess. Uh, it's going to be interesting. That whole Boston thing was very interesting. I was actually in New York on that day, and it's funny because I live in Mexico most of the time, and all my friends in Mexico were like so worried that I was going to the U.S. They're like, are you sure it's really dangerous up there? <laughs> and, and I was like, yeah, I know, I know, but uh, I, I want to go to this conference. I went to that Anarchy in New York conference. And uh, so I'm sitting there in my hotel room when this Boston false flag event happens, and I'm watching it on TV, and this, it went on all day, as everyone knows, and I'm watching it just like, oh, this is unbelievable. And um, then for a moment, because they hadn't found that 19-year-old little boy with the cooking equipment bombs, and uh, then they said, we, we've got some, uh, there's been some chatter. <laughs> I love chatter. That's hilarious. Um, there's been some chatter, and we think they might be headed to New York. And I was just sitting there like, shut up. <laughs> and uh, I'm sitting in my hotel room, and then Bloomberg comes on, like within seconds. I don't know, like it must be all pre. I don't know. I don't. I don't know what they do. Uh, but uh, uh, he comes on. He goes, "If they're coming to New York, we're going to lock this city down." And I was just like, I just looking at my luggage, like, yeah, maybe I'll just throw my stuff in my luggage, get in a taxi, head to somewhere outside of New York State. Um, but then a few, about a half hour later, and all my friends in Mexico are calling me. They're like. We told you you're gonna something bad's gonna happen if you go up there. I'm like I know, I know. But uh, then they found him in a, when they found him in the boat. I was like the happiest guy on earth at that moment in time. I'm like oh thank God, thank God. Uh, so well, not that he was even probably even there or that he even did anything. But that's whole beside the point. Um, so uh, yeah, I think bullets are. Why did I even get started on this story? Bullets. Um, bullets are definitely a good investment. Not only of course because of uh, financial reasons, but also to protect yourself. There's going to be, I don't know what's going to happen here. I really don't know. I think it's going to be unbelievable. Um, and you can see all the things the governments are doing. Did anyone hear about, I don't know if this is true. Did, did the US government just buy like thousands of guillotines? Did anyone hear this? I don't think it's true. I hope it's not true. Um, <laughs> but you never know. It's crazy what's going on. This is going to be. Uh, wild. Um, and so yeah, I try not to actually come up to the US very much anymore for that reason. Uh, it's, uh, and the funny part is, like most people don't know, and I get this, asked this question all the time because I've traveled around, I've lived around the world, I've, I've, been, I've lived in Thailand for a number of years, I lived in Mexico for the last five years, I'm starting a project in Chile uh, right now, so I'm down there a lot, and uh, I've been to about 100 countries along the way. And people think, because of the media, and this is what they do, they, they want you to think the rest of the world is scary. Uh, they, so they put out on the press, oh, Mexico is out of control. Um, you know, 35 people get shot every day in Chicago, but they never start off on ABC News with bloodbath in Chicago, out of control. No, they just start off, oh, there was a headless body found in Mexico, don't go there. And it's really not like that at all. I was actually in a uh, restaurant in uh, Aruba, in the Caribbean, and I was sitting beside this uh, woman from New York, and I told her I've been traveling and I've been to about 100 countries. And she said to me, 
oh, wow, you've been to 100 countries. You must have been seen some incredibly dangerous and scary things. And I actually sat back in my chair for a second because I'd never heard anyone say that before to me. And I thought about it for a good 30 seconds. I was like, I can't think of one situation I really thought was scary or dangerous along the entire trip. And, uh, and I, th I thought a little bit harder because I was like, I don't think there's one thing. And then I, I thought a bit and I went, you know, there actually was two times I actually feared for my life in the last 10 years. And she goes, oh, where was that? And I went, both times it was New York City. <laughs> like, you know, th I, the world is not a scary place. It is, the media wants you to think that. The government wants you to think that. They want people to think it's, it's really scary out there. It's definitely not. Uh, it's much better in so many ways. I really don't like coming up here at all. Uh, and I love, the, of course, uh, coming to Porkfest, but coming up to the U.S., uh, I flew through L.A. yesterday, and oh, that, that's a third world airport I've never seen. Oh, my God, it's, it's like a, oh. And it's funny because a lot of people think the U.S. is still this very rich place, and everything here is very modern. Once you travel, almost any airport, like Thailand airport's a billion dollar airport, it's beautiful. Uh, LAX is like a prison camp with, like, oh my god, I hate that airport so much. Of course, the TSA and all that stuff, so it's actually kind of funny because I was, I was flying up through Mexico City, and Mexico City, now Mexico's not perfect, just so you know, like no place is perfect, of course. Uh, so in Mexico City, they have these, um, the security at the airport are all in wheelchairs. I guess they, the government, someone in government said, oh, let's give jobs to people in wheelchairs so we look like we're nice people or something. But there's security guards in wheelchairs. And so I walk up to the one, and it was like this 50-year-old fat woman in a wheelchair. And she's looking at my passport and looking up at me. And, and I was getting a little irritated because you know, first of all, I'm in Mexico, usually it's a little bit better, and she was taking, like, she was taking her job very seriously, and uh, so I kind of got a little, like, not upset with her, but I was making some motions, like, let's go, and uh, she looks up at me, and she goes, you know, I'm here to protect you, and I'm looking down at her, I'm like, I, I got this, don't worry about it, like, <laughs> like, and then I came through LAX, and I got my, or actually, yeah, LA, and uh, my pat down this time was from a man named King from China with a Q. He was about four foot eight. And same thing, he's, you know, he's patting me down and he's like, you don't seem to be very appreciative of this <laughs> service. And I was like, yeah, I didn't even say anything because it was such a stupid comment. And he basically was saying the same thing, like, well, I'm here to protect you. I'm like, King, <laughs> I'm fine. Don't worry about it. Like, it's just crazy, all this stuff. Um, so I didn't know I was actually supposed to speak for an hour. I thought it was a half hour. So that was basically all the things I had planned to talk about. Uh, but I do have lots of stuff I can talk about. That's no problem. And we can have anyone has any questions or anything. I can talk about I'm doing a development in Chile, a libertarian expat community, if you're interested in that. Oh, okay. So yeah, I'm... Uh, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of the Free State Project, for sure. If you're going to live in the U.S., definitely gravitate to places like this. You want to be around like-minded, non-violent people who understand uh, the system. Uh, when this collapses, you don't want to be in downtown Los Angeles when all the EBT cards get shut off. That's not going to be pretty. Um, so, yeah, I definitely support it. And then I went to Doug Casey's place in Argentina uh, a few years ago, probably four years ago, three years ago. And uh, he, he's doing a similar thing there, but it's quite expensive. Um, in La Estancia de Cafajate in Salta province. Uh, very beautiful. Um, and, but I heard from some people that it was a little expensive. They don't really like Argentina, some people, for obvious reasons. Uh, the Argentine government's gone completely out of control. Uh, like, they've gone almost full commie. And <laughs> never go full commie. <laughs> and uh, so... Uh, when I was talking to people, and, and so many people are so interested in, in this sort of thing, uh, and of course as an entrepreneur, that's what I do, is I listen to w where the people are going, what they want, and try to provide that for them. And um, so we looked around the world, and I, I was looking for a place that uh, had a number of different uh, things. Uh, I wanted to be in a country that was, uh, had some economic potential, uh, that wasn't overly regulated, uh, that, um, preferably in Latin America, I was really looking in that area, and there wasn't a lot of options uh, for what I was looking for, but by far the best was Chile. 
Uh, not many people know what's going on down there, but it's um, their government, actually most of their government are people who've read Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged and really like it. Uh, I got introduced to the brother of the president recently because he's a huge Ayn Rand fan and someone just connected me with him. I haven't talk and talk to, spoken with him yet, but uh, these are the kind of people that are running the government. So about 20 years ago, they were quite communist and it was a mess, of course. And uh, since then, the Chilean people, and there's not a lot of population, I, th I believe the total population is 13 million or something, so it's quite small. But many of them said, this is stupid, let's get back to just being more normal, uh, less communist. And uh, for the last 20 years or so, they've gone more and more free market. Uh, Chile, by far, by far, is probably one of the, well, it's by far the freest uh, country in South America, by far. And it might, you could even make an argument that it's one of the freest in the world, except for on certain areas, uh, including uh, taxes. But uh, the government is uh, doing all the right sort of things. If you're going to have a government, of course, we don't want a government. But if you're going to have one, you might as well have a decent one. And they, uh, there's the, the Chilean government has almost zero debt. Compare that to the US. Uh, they rarely ever have any deficits, ever. Um, the central bank is actually run by what are called Friedmanites, people from the Chicago School of Economics, which is not perfect. Uh, there, there is no need for a central bank, of course. Uh, central banks are an unnecessary evil, just like government. But uh, they, they actually don't print a lot of money. And if they do, they tell people exactly how much they're printing, and all the prices actually automatically adjust through the economy. So it's better. And because of that, it's booming. And also, their taxes aren't... Uh, it's, it's fairly high, but there's ways to get it down to a point where it's, it's really not that high. Uh, you can do so many things to uh, write off so many things. So they have fairly low taxes, uh, very little regulation, which is great. Um, they just uh, put in a thing down there where you can open a corporation in one day over the internet in Chile. Uh, so, and very easily and very cheaply. And they're trying to attract those kinds of things. So they're trying to, to attract people who want to do business, who want to be entrepreneurial. Uh, and it's, it's working great. If anyone's been to Santiago, I, I went for the first time to Santiago in about 2005. And it was sort of like this small town and it was quiet and uh, not much going on, but it was nice. And uh, I went back last year and it's starting to look like Hong Kong. It's nothing but just glass skyscrapers going up everywhere. All you see on the street in the daytime is people in business suits just going with their iPads and iPhones doing deals. Um, so it's really booming. And so we found this property, uh, Santiago, not everyone knows, but it's not on the ocean. It's about two hours inland. And uh, halfway to the ocean from Santiago is where we've put Galt's Gulch. And uh, another hour or 45 minutes really is the ocean with Viña del Mar, which is one of the nicest uh, oceanside resorts I've ever been to. Uh, and it's all booming. And all, that whole corridor is all wineries and businesses. And uh, it's really an amazing place. So yeah, we've just started uh, uh, selling lots, pre-sale lots there. I don't know what kind of information you're interested in, but uh, we've just started doing that, and it's going incredibly well. We've got an uh, un unbelievable amount of interest. It's really even surprised me, because we, really, we haven't actually announced that we're even doing this officially yet. We haven't even put out a press release. The website's not even fully up yet. We just have a place marker and already hundreds of people have been coming down just asking us how do I get in on this so it's been amazing uh, and I'm pretty sure it's going to do very well and so yeah that's what I'm doing down in Chile I uh, don't know if anyone has any questions or specific questions hello sorry uh, so could you describe for us uh, what, what it would be like for an entrepreneur that wants to move down there and start a business? You just said they had this start a corporation in a day thing. Um, you know, what, what would it be like if we still have customers back here in the U.S.? And uh, generally, what's the cultural shock like moving down there? Sure. Uh, the Chilean government actually has this program. It's, I forget the exact name. It's something like Entrepreneurs Program. And they'll actually give you a grant to come to Chile and start a business. Uh, so that's very interesting. I, of course, don't like the government involvement in anything, but if they're going to give you money... I used to be uh, two ways on that. I used to think I never want to take money from government. Now I think 
I should just take as much as I can, just you know, so we can get rid of them faster, right? So, yeah. I actually just heard someone's taking out a bunch of student loans uh, to invest in our Chilean project. So that's interesting. Um, culture shock. It's really you know, if you've been to. Not, you know, a lot of people haven't been outside of the U.S. and they think it's, it's all wild. Uh, Chile is a very, it's the most, it's the most, what? Uh, yeah, there's the student loan guy. Um, I didn't name him, I don't want to get in trouble. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, Chile is by far the most uh, European style of uh, Latin American countries. Uh, most of the people look generally like Europeans. Um, Especially in the Santiago area, that whole area, it's, it's mostly all fairly European looking people, very European style living. Uh, we just had some people come down, they said this is more European than Europe now with all the, what's going on over there. Um, so yeah, no, it's, it's not much culture shock. The biggest thing of course is the language. Uh, I speak Spanish fairly decent now because I lived in Mexico for five years, but the Chilean Spanish is quite different from Mexican Spanish. I went down with my wife to Chile and she's like, I don't know what they're saying, <laughs> and I was the same way. So the, you know, you're gonna have to go through things like that. Yeah. No. Thanks. And uh, real quick, infrastructure, power, internet. You know, internet's pretty important. How's that? How's that? Oh yeah. You know, every time I come to the U.S., I'm like, nothing really works. Like we don't have cell phone service here. This is very strange coming from Mexico or Chile. Uh, I just I was just on a radio show in the U.S. and the guy said I, I'm kind of scared to move to Mexico because I work over the internet, and uh, and I was like, well, I'm talking to you from a hundred megabit line in Acapulco right now that has never gone down since I've had the line, and it costs about sixty dollars a month, and I'm on my 4G phone when I leave here. Um, you know, a lot of the the infrastructure and technology in a lot of these places is better than the US because they've kind of leapfrogged a lot of generations. So people didn't even have landline phones and stuff in some of these places. And then now they're just 4G and, and fiber optic and stuff like that. So yeah, it's just very, very good. Awesome, thank you. Sir? Oh, thank you. Uh, what level of home rule do you have in Galt's Gulch? Is it a municipal uh, corporation or exactly what? What are you able to do uh, that other municipalities or whatever might have stricter laws against, and what what have you been able to accomplish with that? Yeah, this is not a uh, this is just a real estate project. This we're not uh, free cities or anything like that. We haven't negotiated with the government to let us have our own rules and laws and taxes, uh, but we have found a place where it's it's not too bad, and we're willing to work within those areas. And if you look even what uh, they've been doing with the free cities, they tried to do a free city in Honduras. I still think they haven't got it done. Uh, it's very hard to convince any government to give up their power uh, in their geographic region because as soon as they do, if that region has no taxes and no major regulations, no crazy laws, um, that area will turn into Hong Kong in like three years and it'll make them look stupid. And uh, so most people don't want to do that. So this is just a real estate project. Uh, but what we're trying to do is try to, um, you know, attract people who are like-minded and freedom lovers down there. We're, go we're planning on having a gun range on the property. And the, the reason for that is Chilean uh, gun laws uh, are, aren't too bad. Uh, you can have guns. You have to get a license or permission from the government. Uh, but you, you can only own two. And I know that's not enough for some people here. And uh, if you have a gun club, if you're part of a gun club, you can have much more guns. So we're planning on having a gun club on the property. So. Um, is it just a development, or are you also having businesses there? Like, um, are you taking suggestions for businesses, and also are you taking any, are you looking for to fill any jobs for the place, like staff, et cetera? Yeah, definitely. Uh, sorry. Definitely. Hello? There we go. Um, yeah, the, the, what we're trying to do, what we want to do, I don't know if this is loud now. Can you hear me? Yep. See a little bit. Um, we, we're trying to get people to come down who are entrepreneurial and um, start up their own businesses. Uh, so we're not going to create a lot of things at Galt's Gulch that are going to be part of the community. We're, we're going to hope that a lot of people come down and say, oh, there should be a store here on the property or there should be a gym and start up their own uh, things. Uh, 
that's the way that we'd like to see this develop. And of course, yeah, once we get rolling, there will be tons of opportunities. For entrepreneurs, there'll be tons of opportunities. There's going to be a lot of people down there who have different needs and wants. And, and if you can supply those things to them, you can do very well. And as far as us hiring, uh, we're not at the point quite yet where we're doing a lot of hiring except for salespeople because we have to sell it first before we build it. Uh, but um, yeah, once we get to that point, we'll definitely have a lot of opportunities. And we'll be looking, obviously, to only employ freedom-minded people. Obviously, we don't want any neocons or communists working for us. Oh, thank you so much. And just a last quick question. Is it in, in the uh, middle of nowhere? So is it kind of be able to form its, become its own city? Yeah, it's, it's, it is. It's, when you're out there, it seems like you're in the middle of nowhere. It's completely surrounded by mountains. It's in a valley. Uh, but it's also very close to Santiago and Viña del Mar. And we're actually trying to buy up, uh, if we can, it's still in process, 65 square kilometers of land, uh, which is half the size of Santiago. So if this goes well, uh, this could be very interesting what happens there. And uh, actually, Wendy McElroy, I'm sure many of you have heard of her. Uh, she works with us on some things. And she actually wants to write a book on what we're doing. She thinks it's, it's that, uh, it could be that sort of life-changing uh, sort of to do something like this. So I, I never thought of it that way, but that's what she thought. So I thought that was interesting. Thank you so much. I had just heard or just read a few days ago, um, I'm trying to think of whose business page it was, but it said the North Korean currency had basically uh, uh, collapsed due to uh, uh, misuse or disuse because the, the government a couple of years ago slashed two decimal points off the value of the uh, currency. I believe it's called the won, W-O-N. and. Um, and as a result, in spite of uh, harsh penalties, such as being shot uh, at a moment's notice, if you're using foreign currency, everyone has gone to using foreign currency, which means the official currency is essentially useless, used by only a small portion of the population now. So even the most tyrannical government can lose control of its currency and hence of its people. So I thought that was very interesting. I wonder if you've heard about that. It's only in the last few days, and again, I can't remember whose business page it was I saw it, whether it was Bloomberg's or Reuters or uh, <clears throat> Washington Times, I'm not quite sure, but, but I thought that was out there. And it gave, it gave me the idea that maybe there would be a transition period where the, the currencies most, so, so the North Koreans have been too greedy, they've slashed two decimal points off their currency, the Argentina, uh, they're taking half a decimal point off of theirs. Japan's taking half a decimal point off of theirs. So people are going to flee these currencies, and for the immediate time being, anything that is, any central bank that is less greedy than that might uh, have a, a, a relative benefit as people seek, th say, this country's currency as a haven from, say, the yen, for example. Yeah, well, I think the uh, all currencies will collapse. Uh, they're all not, all of them are not backed by anything. Um, once they all start to teeter and start to fall, it's going to be a waterfall effect, especially the US dollar. That will affect almost every currency on earth because most of them, most of the reserves are just US dollars. Uh, Canada, for example, just uh, all their reserves, all, the only thing backing the Canadian dollar is the US dollar. They sold all their gold in the 1980s. Um, funny story about chopping decimals off. I went to Paraguay recently and I'm sitting beside a Paraguayan businessman and he's very proud of Paraguay and he's so happy I'm coming there. And this is very normal in most countries. They're very happy to have outsiders, especially Westerners who they think are, are know more about capitalism and usually do. Uh, so he was very happy but he's probably telling me all these great things about Paraguay and um, you know in Paraguay I think 100,000 Paraguayan uh, Guyanis is what they call it, is where you can buy like a Coca-Cola with it or something. And so he was very proud. He goes, you know, we're the only country in South America that's never chopped any zeros off of our currency. So you go for dinner and it's like billions of dollars. It's like, oh, yeah, good job. Uh, I think it'd be better if you just did that. Uh, you get these bills with these numbers you can't even calculate on a, like a regular calculator. Uh, yeah, so it's going to be interesting when all the currencies collapse. I, I, there's no safe currency at all. Uh, you have to get out. This system is going down. Yeah, thank you. Hey, Jim. Randy here. <laughs> hey. Um, Edward Snowden, could you talk as a vigilante? 
Sorry, as a vigilante, Edward Snowden, could you talk about him um, and the amazing work? I mean, I think that he, he, in the past century, we've not seen someone who has done something like him as a whistleblower. And also, I'll just sit down, uh, that have we, have we reached the bottom for silver, please? <laughs> Yeah, I think so. On the silver part, yeah. Uh, it can't go much lower than this, in my opinion. Uh, Edward Snowden's very interesting. I, you know, unless I see someone or meet someone in person, I never uh, let, you know, like to be too concrete about who they are or what they are. For all I know, Edward Snowden could be fake or some sort of a whatever. But if he is real, and if what he did is real, uh, we might look back on him as being a great hero uh, in the future. Um, you know, it's just unbelievable uh, that not... Not many people do this. Not many people are willing to give up anything. And that's sort of the funny thing, right? Because the statists, the collectivists all say, oh, we, you know, we have to give up ourselves for society. But no one ever really does that to save us from government. There's very few people who are willing to give up their freedom uh, and their life uh, just to expose the government. And he's one of them. So he definitely could go down as a, a great hero, uh, as, as well as the uh, founder, or the maker of Bitcoin, whoever that was, that we could look back on that in 10 or 20 years. Like these guys, like we'll be building monuments, you know, hopefully private money uh, <laughs> with no governments building monuments to these people. Are we done? Yeah. Sorry, I'm out of time. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. See you. 